Now, Sister, uh, Sister Bev mentioned that your cups were full, and I give God all the glory for that. It's nothing, nothing in me, nothing, but I have a question for you. Do you have room for like maybe a little bit more? Can we just fill it up a little, just a little? Praise God, praise God. Well, I'm not one that believes in throwaway meetings. This is our last meeting, but no, I don't believe in that. We're going to take it as strong and as high as we can today. Amen? Amen. To finish off really, really strong and on a high, high note. So the title of our message, as our dear sister mentioned, is Another Octobill Part 2. We established on Friday that we are living at the time of the end, right? During, in the time of the end, just before the second coming. Amen. And just because, because we are at this point in time in Earth's history, we need to be taking what we're doing, I believe, a lot more serious than we are. Everybody can come up a little higher, amen? Every single one of us can come up a little higher. From Ted Wilson all the way down to Brother Wesley. Everybody needs to come up higher. Every single one of us. So this, this morning's message is going to be kind of a summarization in sort of a way to send us all home, hopefully by God's grace, full. Amen? Amen. So the key today, the key this whole weekend has been to put ourselves in position by God's grace and asking for his help. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Yes. Can you hear me on the speakers? Yeah. Okay. To, let me back up a little, brother, so you can notch it up a little bit, just a little bit. Is that better? We have to be willing to do what God says no matter what it is. And I repeated that and tried to really hammer that home all weekend. There's a verse that I love in Isaiah 4, verse 1. Isaiah wrote, in that day, meaning the last days at the end, the future, right? According to Isaiah, in that day, seven women, women will take hold of one man, saying we will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel, only let us be called by they, thy name to take away our approach. Reproach, reproach. So what that verse is saying actually is we know the number seven equals complete, right? That's according to Numbers 23, verse 15. Seven Sabbaths shall be unto you complete. A woman represents the church. We all know that, right? Yeah. We know that from Jeremiah 6, 2, Isaiah 51, 16, and 2 Corinthians 11, 2. Put all those together for those in the world who don't believe that prophetic uh, language, and that sums it up for them, those three. Jeremiah 6, 2, Isaiah 51, 16, and 2 Corinthians 11, 2. A woman represents a church prophetically. So one church will take hold of one man. That man is Jesus. And what they're going to say is, we will wear our own apparel and eat our own bread. Yeah. Only let us be called by thy name, Christians, to take away our reproach or our shame. Yeah. So what they're saying is, we want to do whatever we want, but we still want to be called disciples. I believe that that prophecy is happening in our day right now because many Christians and many Seventh-day Adventist Christians want to do what they want and don't want to submit to the will of God, completely 1,000% submit. The only way we're going to punch that ticket into heaven, brothers and sisters, is 100% submission to God's will, 100%, including health, including diet. I know I sound like a broken record or a scratch CD, amen. But we have to submit to this health reform message or we're going to be in trouble. It is more important than most of us realize. Mm -hmm. And most of it is physiological. It's not just a, 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 a component of our message. It's physiological. What we eat affects the brain. It affects our relationship, our frontal lobe, our relationship with the Lord. It's as simple as that. So please consider that as we study today. Amen. Please consider that. It is very, very critical. We are to do what? Hunt and fish for men. Are you ready to go hunting? Sometimes you will catch fish and sometimes you will not. But we are to persevere in the work of God, knowing that he has given us a message to who? Unbelievers. So who's given us this message? God has. A message that will win its way to how many hearts? Many, many. We just need to get out there and not put so much emphasis on our ability because we have none. 
if we would just consider, brothers and sisters, we have all of heaven at our disposal waiting for us to call on them for help. And that's what they do. That is what they do. And love to do it, to help us. So may God help us to understand and recognize this morning to take full advantage, not in a negative way, but in cooperating, co-working, co-laboring with God. Amen? Amen. Let's pause for a brief word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you again this morning, thanking you so much for gathering us here together in your house of worship, in your sanctuary, your synagogue, your temple, your church. Please be with us, Lord. We need your company, and we know that you enjoy our company. Please send angels to be here with us, to tabernacle here with us for this, the rest of this day, not just here in this meeting, but the rest of this day. If there be any demonic agencies here for whatever reason, Please kindly escort them out of this place so we can worship you in spirit and truth without any interruption or distraction. Amen. We love, ask, and thank you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 Are you ready to study? Amen. 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 All right. First question. Where does God want his people to live? I'll give you one, one chance, one answer. In the country. As God's commandment-keeping people. We must leave the cities. Now, we have until 11, 12, 1230? Or oh, 1 o'clock. 1 o'clock, okay. We're going to go all the way to that point. I guarantee it. <laughs> we must leave the cities. As did Enoch, we must work in the cities, but not dwell in them. Did we talk about that yesterday? Get in, evangelize, get out. Get out. Why? Influence. Enoch walked with God, and yet he did not live in the midst of any city, polluted with every kind of violence and wickedness, as did Lot in Sodom. Now, I remember in 2 Peter chapter 2, the Bible calls Peter a righteous man and just. He was living up to all the light that he had. He just made a bad choice. Remember when they separated in Genesis 13? By the way, that was done or, or instigated by Sister Lot. I mentioned yesterday she was a wicked sister, unconverted, wicked. And Lot saw opportunity for enterprise and money making on the, plain, the plains of, of Sodom. That's what he saw. So that's why he chose there. His wife loved money. Lot and Abraham were both very wealthy. And Sister Lot liked to spend money. That's why she wanted to go there too. It was a bad choice, though. He lost almost his whole family because of that, right? And then his daughters that went with him had to engage in an incestuous relationship to try to maintain the family seat. So just wickedness all over the place. There was influence there, wasn't there? Yes, there was. All that Lot and his family did in Sodom could have been done by them even if they had lived in a place some distance away from the city. We're talking about God's plan. We're talking about God's plan evangelizing a city without living in that city. Didn't we just read that right here? The same work could have been done. But again, Lot made a bad choice. Is God merciful? Is Lot, is Lot going to be in heaven? Yes, he is. So that's, that's hope for me and hope for you, right? As messed up as we are, and as bad of a decision Lot made, he still lived up to all the light he did. He could and tried to do all he could in the midst of all that wickedness. Bible says that he was vexed by what was taking place in that city. But he's going to be saved. He's going to be saved. The Lord calls for his people to locate 322 miles away from the cities. Is that what that says? <laughs> Don't let anybody tell you that Sister White said there was a mile marker in terms of how far you should be. That is nowhere in the spirit of prophecy. But there's a principle we're going to look at this morning. There's a clear-cut principle regarding how far we should be. Away is the word that's used here. Away from the cities. For in such an hour as ye think not, fire and brimstone will be rained from heaven upon these cities. Can I someone to do me a real big favor and bring me a cup of water, please? Anybody. I appreciate that. Out of the cities is my message at this time. Be assured that the call is for our people to locate miles away, 
not how many miles or a designated number of miles, miles away from the large cities. But again, there's a principle we're going to learn this morning. He, God, wants us to live where we can have, what, elbow room. Our first country moved 2009. We moved, I mentioned yesterday, to western Tennessee. And I got there. We got there. We were fired up. We bought a brand new mower from Lowe's, not far away. I'm out there maybe a weekend. I'm mowing the front lawn, and one car goes by, and then another car goes by, and I see a few more cars go by, and then a few military vehicles are going by. I'm like, wait a minute. Something's not right here. So I went, went in the house, and I told my wife, I said, wife, I feel exposed out there. I feel very exposed. Something's wrong. So we started thinking from that point forward. Maybe we didn't make the right choice. But again, it's a, it's a process. We were learning. But we were so happy and excited to get out of L.A., we made a bad decision. So part of our motivation for sharing this country living message is to teach people not to make the same mistakes we made. We made some big mistakes at first. We made, they really came back to bite us, too. Big mistakes. So one neighbor was too close. The other side, it was all field. Thank you, brother. I really appreciate that. Amen. House was too close. I could throw a rock at this guy. He had a huge utility building. The utility building was actually bigger than his house. The road, neighbors right across the road, mailboxes close together. I, I couldn't get away from the, from the people. It was just too close. Bad choice. So we did end up moving again for a family illness that I won't disclose. And praise God, he brought us back to the country four and a half years later. But we need to have elbow room. A principle I like, I like to use is, you don't want to see your neighbors, and they shouldn't see you. The barometer is winter when there's no foliage. That's when you really can tell the difference between being too close and not too close. You have to, if by God's grace, try to estimate how far they are. You don't want to see them. You need elbow room. You, want, you don't want any interference. But again, if you have a situation like us where our nearest neighbor from door to door is one half mile away, and their present truth believers is just like the, us, 100%, it's a perfect scenario. Perfect situation. We couldn't have dreamed it up any better. Any better. And we're very pleased with it. We are not to locate ourselves where we will be forced into close relations with those who do not honor God. Is that important? A crisis is soon to come in regard to the observance of the Sunday. Country Living, page 20. We should now begin to heed the instruction given us over and over again. Get out of the cities into rural districts where the houses are not crowded close together or closely together and where you will be able, I'm sorry, free from the interference of enemies. At some point, those who don't believe what we believe are going to become our enemies, aren't they? They're not going to like us, and I'm putting that lightly. They're going to have a problem with us. So we have to do all we can, even though we're near them now, to evangelize them. So by God's grace, they will like us. Amen? Can God do that? Yes, he can. We're talking about a principle now. Principle. In 1903, <clears throat> when a site was being sought for the factory of the Review and Herald, and the committee was searching in the vicinity of New York, we were counseled that, quote, any place within 30 miles of that city would be too near. That's Review and Herald, August 11th, 1903. By the way, this is a book called From City to Country Living. This is what's called, they actually call this book a sister book to the book Country Living. It was written by E.A. Sutherland and author L. White, Sister White's son. From City to Country Living, very, very good book. Very good book. The need of a sanitarium, quote, in the vicinity of New York City was urged upon us, and we were to search for locations just out from the large cities where suitable buildings may be secured and used for institutional work as a worker base. 30 miles. Now keep in mind, this is 1903. New York was a big city in 1903 also, but was it as, is it, was it as big then as it is now? Yeah. Absolutely not. Let's continue. In Southern California, <clears throat> Ellen White saw the gracious leading of God in preparing the way for us to begin the work of the Paradise Valley Sanitarium a few miles, which was I researched seven miles, south of San Diego. In bold contrast to the earlier intention of some who, seeming to have lost sight of the plain instruction of the Lord, had given, instead of planning to find some country location suitable for sanitarium work, 
sought to establish a mammoth institution in the heart of the city of Los Angeles. Would that have been God's plan? No. Remember, Sister White calls Battle Creek a mammoth institution. Same terminology. Too big, number one, and number two, it was located in a city. That is not God's plan. Now, you might say, well, seven miles south of San Diego, isn't that kind of close? But that's not San Diego now. That's San Diego back then, 1903, 1904. The official population of San Diego back then was around 17,000 people. Plus, the modes of transportation weren't as prevalent and as you know, su suitable as they are now. Not as many choices, right? That's right? So now, seven miles from San Diego, which has now, what, almost two million people, would be insane. It'd be suicide, yeah. especially for your children. Because now they can just call Uber and get over there in an instant. In an instant. We all know that. Likewise, Mrs. White saw advantages to be gained in moving our New England sanitarium from South Lancaster, 40 miles from Boston, to Melrose, a place much nearer Boston. Wasn't Boston a big city back then, too? Yes. Not as big as now, but it was still a big city. So she's saying they should move closer to Boston and yet far enough removed from the busy city so that the patients may have the most favorable conditions for recovery of health. Did you get that? Yeah. The transfer of the New England sanitarium to a place so convenient to the city of Boston is in God's providence. So this is the lesson. This is the principle. You move away from a city, not too far where you can't get to the city in case your health guests or your family needs some health attention at a hospital, common sense, but not too close where your children are influenced by the city. Are you with me? Yeah. Very simple principle. So I'm going to show you in a few minutes where we are in terms of the nearest small city, medium city, major city. And that's God's plan. We just read that, didn't we? That is in God's providence. So you don't want to live 900 miles from a city. That won't do anybody any good. We have to use common sense too. And God has given us common sense. Amen. We have to be very careful not to be extremists. But keep everything in the middle of the road. Amen. Middle of the road. It is plain, same book, that the satisfactory rural conditions or locations of these institutions brought them within convenient distance to centers of population and yet sufficiently isolated to gain the blessing of the country locations. Amen? Yeah. In nearly all these cases, these institutions were within 10 miles of a metropolitan area back then. Yet in each case, it was considered at the time of writing that they were located in the country. So even though they may be 10 miles from San Diego, 10 miles from Boston, whatever, it was still a country environment. It still wasn't, they weren't being influenced by those cities that they were close to. Not at all. And I've learned that in our experience. Even the town, the nearest town from us, which is about, there's two towns right in the middle. One town 30 miles away, one town about 35 miles away. And I'm telling you, when I'm in those little towns doing shopping or evangelizing or whatever I'm doing, one thing I've learned, the last thing on their mind, it was what's going on 30 miles from there. They're not thinking about what's going on in the country 30 miles away. So if the crisis hits, they don't have any water, no food, whatever. All they're going to be concerned about is, how do I get fed right where I am? I'm not going to go out, way out and try to rob their gardens. Now, I might get to that point at some point. I don't know. But I'm telling you, even in the major city, San Francisco, L.A., they are not thinking about or going to be thinking about what's going on 50 miles away at somebody's garden in their backyard. Trust me, it's gonna be enough drama going on in those cities to deal with. Consideration must also be given to the fact that what would be country to one family may not be country to another. What does she mean by that? What does he mean by that? The family background, whether or not there are children, the ages of the children, the educational needs, the occupational skills, together with opportunities and special aptitudes for missionary work, some have that, some don't, are all factors that enter into determination of the case of each family as to just what constitutes country and the degree of isolation desirable. So the bottom line is what we have to do is we have to do what? Pray. The first thing is to pray and ask God, where do you want me? Where do you need me to be? Does he know? I rest my case. So that is our humble little place, our humble little outpost. That's where we sleep at night. 
I mentioned to you that it, God blessed us with 40 acres. This is our house right here. This is my shop, 20 by 50. These are our two little humble little greenhouses. One's 24 by 96, one is 20 by 80. My, my wife sleeps out here in here most of the time, but a lot of times she sleeps out here too. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. Now this is what we affectionately refer to as the L because you see this is an L-shaped kind of a thing between where we drive onto the property and then down there. I bush hogged this. We all know the term bush hog. Yeah. Okay, I bush hogged this maybe three times a year. And I have to do it so wide and so long, I have to do it in stages. I don't cut it all, you know, the whole thing in one day at one time. But I usually cut it in half. So you see here there's like a little crease right here. So I, I usually come from here to here, come across, cut that. That takes me about maybe, maybe three hours, more or less, and I'll do the rest maybe a day or two later. We try to keep the edges clear all the time for walking. You see that right there? For walking, for company going on walk, health patients, whatever, whatever it is. So I'm showing you this for a reason. This is another angle. See so my trailer, our vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. Now, Tennessee is a very pretty state. It's a very pretty state, believe me. Now, if you're looking for country property, you can learn a lot going on the websites and on Realtor.com and all these real estate websites. But one thing you can't tell by looking at this picture, this drone, overhead drone shot, is the topography. So you, you have, to, I would strongly recommend, you have to go and see it for yourself. Yeah. Please don't buy a property without going to see it. That would be suicide. And a lot of people did that during COVID. A lot of people bought property sight unseen. People with money that could afford to do that were doing that. People from California were buying stuff all over the country, all over the U.S., just buying it sight unseen. But they, their, they, their mission is not our mission. So it's important to know exactly what's going on on your land. So looking at this from above ground, from the air, it looks like it's all one level property, but it is not that. It is not. This hill here, this road that comes to the property is a very steep decline and incline, all gravel. And from this point all the way up here is very steep, Especially, particularly from here up is very steep. But can you tell that on this picture? No, you can't. The house is here. This here to the side of the house, this is a slope going down, a steep little drop, drop off. We leave the house, we walk out on this little pathway, and then we come up, trying to go up, going toward the garden area, there's a little incline right here, like a little slope, but you can't see that. And then when you're over here in the garden, you leave the garden area and walk up to the L, there's another slope going up here, up to this flat part here. But that's impossible to really dictate or see from a picture from above. So now you can kind of get a better idea. Here's the house, right here at the edge, that's a sleep, sleep, slope, steep slope. Say that five times fast. This is a steep slope going right over, right? But you can't see, you can see it now, but you can't see it from a drone. So I've, I've, I've been doing this so long and have helped so many people, I can pretty much estimate from the road to the house how many yards it is. I can, pretty, I can tell that almost, almost to the T accurately because I've been doing it so long. <clears throat> so. We had a bunch of trees. We first bought the property in 2015. We had a bunch of trees, about seven trees here, all in front. Beautiful trees, a lot of shade, but inspiration tells us, oh, you guys know already, praise the Lord. What happens when a bunch of leaves continue to fall and fall and die and die? Mold. Mold, that's right. So we had a guy in the area that was referred to us. He has these, what he calls his, his toys, these huge bulldozers, and he has all these toys. And he came over and yanked up every one of them. And I was amazed. I, I saw the power of God when this brother did this. When he pulled up that, the first tree, the biggest one, and I learned that trees have what they call a ball root. And this, this thing was like, I couldn't believe how big it was. It was unbelievable how big this thing was. I'm like, that, that much of the tree is underground? It was amazing. God is wonderful. It was amazing. So we got rid of all that. And here we are today in 2015. This, this picture is maybe, I don't know, a year old, maybe a year and a half. It's not that old. So our country living model, distance to nearest neighbor's front door, half a mile. I literally got in one of the vehicles. I got up closest to our door as I could up by the porch and the sidewalk. And I drove out off our property, through our gate, through their gate, all the way to their house, to their front door. And it was exactly one half mile. That's ideal. 
That's very ideal. They can't see us and we can't see them any time of the year, and we love it. Distance to nearest non-SDA neighbor is also half a mile the opposite direction. She's non-SDA, but she's very friendly. She's very nice. We're good friends. We get along. We've given her literature. It's, it's a nice situation. And she lives alone. We kind of look out for her. She works at night overnight. She's a, she works in, I think, manufacturing or something. But she's a nice sister, and we like her. Distance to nearest post office, three miles. It's a country post office, so it's not open very long, four hours a day. In the big city, San Francisco, LA, you got post offices that are open 24 hours a day, but not in the country, not in the country. Distance to nearest SDA church. Before COVID, it was 30 minutes. That was our home church. After COVID, we switched uh, memberships to another uh, church that's further away, 50 minutes, because a lot of the conferences were closed during COVID. Some were closed, some were open. We wanted to go to church. We couldn't get into the personal, it's a personal pet peeve, but we couldn't get into the Zoom church. We just couldn't get into that. People on there with their curlers in their hair and <laughs> pajamas and they're laying down eating breakfast on the couch during church. We said, that's enough. So we said, we gotta find another church. <laughs> Distance to nearest interstate entrance, exit, five miles, which is good. Not too far, but not too close. Distance to nearest small town, 8,200 people. There's a Walmart there, Walmart there, a Home Depot, there's a small hospital or a clinic 30 minutes away. Second nearest moderate sized town, 43,000 people. There's a Lowe's there and a larger hospital, and that's important. You don't want to be 8 million miles from a hospital. This is reality. We have to consider these things. This is reality, right? And when I hurt my back, even though I was going to the chiropractor for the first couple of weeks, at some point, I went and got you know, an x-ray, and then I went to California and got an MRI and did all that. But you don't want to be too far in case something happens. We're still human. We still live on Earth, so things happen. Amen? Things happen. That's right. That's right. So that's the medium. And there's other stores there that we like that we go to uh, that we can shop at. Distance to nearest major city, 700,000 plus, that's Nashville. Major, major hospitals, et cetera an hour, 15 minutes. We can do more serious shopping there because there's more there because there's more variety, bigger city. Distance to second nearest major city with major hospital and all kinds of stores and everything you need is 400,000 people. That's Huntsville, Alabama. So we're, we're right near, not too far, maybe 20 miles from the border of Alabama and Tennessee. South, they call it South Middle Tennessee. Distance to nearest major airport, and that's important for us. That's an hour and 20 minutes, that's Nashville. We don't fly out of anywhere, basically, except Nashville. Every now and then in Atlanta, but 99% of the time, it's, it's Nashville. Distance to nearest Sprouts Farmer's Market. You guys familiar with Sprouts? No? Okay, yes. Some yes, some no. Okay. They have stuff that we can eat. And it's 50 minutes away. There's, there's two of them. One is in Tennessee, and one is in Alabama. And they're both about the same distance both ways. Nearest Whole Foods, 50 minutes. Again, one in Tennessee, one in Alabama. We can go both ways. Or we can go further to one. There's a couple of them in Nashville, too. And there's also Sprouts in, in Nashville. I'm just giving you the distance and, and time of the nearest ones. Nearest Trader Joe's, 55 minutes, Tennessee and Alabama. <clears throat> distance to back home, 2,300 miles, about four hours, 45 minutes. L.A., a little closer, four-hour flight. Question. Is Nashville, Tennessee bigger than Atlanta, Georgia? This is kind of important. Nashville has an estimated population of around 671,295 people. Atlanta has an estimated population of 512,550 people. Those are two major cities, right? However, the city of Nashville covers 526 square miles, whereas Atlanta only covers 134 square miles. You see the difference? meaning Atlanta has a decidedly greater population density. So you have a lot of people in a much smaller area. It's compacted. Now, Nashville has grown a lot in the last 10 years. It's exploded. It has exploded. Very popular. Let me give you a contrast. Is San Francisco, California crowded? San Francisco has a current estimated population of 808,437 people. The city covers an area of approximately only 46.7 square miles. San Francisco has an astounding population density. So you have a whole lot of people like sardines, really, really packed in. I can't tell the difference because I was born and raised there. To me, it's normal. Now, being in the country nine years now, including the one year back in 29, 2010, now when I go, I feel a little claustrophobic. 
because now I'm accustomed to being around nothing. But again, it's, it was normal for me. I think I read that the, the city on earth with the largest, highest population density is, is Manila in the Philippines. It has the highest, the most people in the smallest area, like 1.7 million people, I think like 40 square miles. That's, that's, that's really tight. That's really tight. I want you to take a picture of this, please. Citydata.com, if you're looking for a country home. This website, it's citydata.com, is the most comprehensive website to me on the whole internet. Anything you need to know about a city, large or small, or even the zip code of that city, population, demographics, churches, uh, crime rate, everything you can think of or imagine is, is on this website. It have a Canada suit also. City, citydata.com, Canada. We were on this thing almost every day when we were searching, almost every day. Very, very comprehensive. I highly recommend it, highly. Citydata.com. They've been around for maybe 15 years, maybe 20 years altogether. And they've really evolved since the early days. They're really deep now. <clears throat> so they have on that website what they call a crime rate index indicator. And they have these graphs where they show you, based on the zip code or the city you type in, the degree of crime compared to the population. So I took New York City and put it on the screen in my uh, uh, study. And New York is 72.6% higher than all US cities. So zero would be down here where the green starts. And New York is up here. That's pretty high, isn't it? New York has high crime. Now, New York has a lot of people, too. So these numbers can be a little watered down based on how many people live there, also the types of crime. But we know with New York is every crime imaginable, A to Z. We all know that. This is Los Angeles. <clears throat> a little higher, isn't it? A little higher. 87.5% higher than those of US cities, all US cities. That's a high crime rate. Now, I took our little town, and in the interest of privacy, I called it Private Town, Tennessee. Look where we are. Almost zero. That is God's plan right there. That is God's plan. We don't worry about anything. We never, ever, 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 just like my dear family here, we never lock our vehicles. Never. Never. I mean, when I say never, I mean, we don't even think about doing it. Never. I think, I think it's at 5% because maybe some teenagers I heard a few years back broke into some barn somewhere and stole a, a, a mower. It was something trivial. Other than that, it's a town of 500 people. There's no sidewalks, no signal light, nothing. Kind of like Cherryville, I guess, amen? <laughs> kind of like Cherryville. So we don't worry about crime there, and that is God's plan. Question. Do you have any counsel on how to avoid mistakes while striving to make the move? This is a communication written December 22nd, 1893 in response to a letter from a leading worker in Battle Creek, informing Mrs. White that in response to the admonition that our people should move out of Battle Creek, between one and 200 were preparing to leave as soon as possible, but they were trying to move the wrong way in a haste. We don't want to do that. Your letter tells me, my brother, that there are many who are stirred deeply to move out of Battle Creek. There is need, great need of this work being done, and now. Those who have felt at last to make a move, let it not be in a what? A rush. This is wise counsel right here. In an excitement or in a rash manner or in a way that hereafter they will deeply regret that they did move out. Take heed that there shall be no rash movements made in heeding the counsel of moving from Battle Creek. Get this. Do nothing. How much, church? Do nothing without seeking wisdom of God, who has promised to give liberally to all who ask and who upbraideth not. All that anyone can do is to advise and counsel, and then leave those who are convicted in regard to duty to move under divine guidance and with their whole hearts open to learn and obey God. That's the key word, too, learn. Remember, remember yesterday we learned that we're in the lower school of earth, preparing and training for the higher school above. We're, we're constantly students, and we will never graduate. We get to heaven, we will never graduate. Can we learn more than God knows? No. That was Satan's problem in Isaiah 14, right? He wants to be like the Most High. You can't be like the Most High. The only way you can be like him is to be above him, because he's above everything. The Madison Blueprint. 
Let's talk about Madison this morning. We really, I'm telling you, we need two weeks, but God is faithful. In the summer of 1904, again, we're talking about what do we do when we get to the country? What do we do when we get there? What is God's plan for our work? What is his mandate from heaven? In the summer of 1904, Sutherland and McGann had discussed their plans with Mrs. White in Nashville, then spent six weeks looking for a suitable location for their school near Nashville. Tennessee was a major part of Bible prophecy, wasn't it? One day in June 1904, Mrs. White, W. Palmer, Sutherland, McGann, and others took a steamboat for a river trip near Nashville, a city of culture, which had become the center of Adventist activity in the South. The boat suddenly broke down at Neely's Bend in the Cumberland River and was towed over to the bank so that repairs could be made. Mrs. White and Mr. Palmer went ashore to look around. Now, this is E.A. Sutherland back then, and this is Percy Tilson McGann, P.T. McGann. Now, his grandson lives in the area we live in. He's E.A. Sutherland III. I befriended his wife. She was working at the local Home Depot in that town I told you was 30 miles away. She was working in the paint department for, for a few years, and now she's not there anymore. I went there one day, and they told me she had, she had quit or retired or whatever she did. But they are descendants of E.A. Sutherland. This is Sutherland here, and this is, let me go back. I want to make sure I get this right. Yeah, this is Sutherland, and this is McGann. Obviously, much, old, much later and much older now at this point. This is Sister White. This is, this is, let me make sure I get this right. Yeah. This is Sutherland here, and this is McGann right here. And, this, and these are other, I think one of these is Sister McInturfer. You guys ever heard her name? And there's some others. These, these are high power Adventist, you know, pioneers back then. I've been meaning to put their names on here so we could all identify them. But you've heard of all of them. I, I saw their names in some pictures somewhere else. But this is a great picture of Sister White in her later years. Amen? They found themselves on a 412-acre farm overgrown with buckbrush full of stones and gullies worn out and run down. So the average person would see that and say, there's no way I'm going to live there. But brothers and sisters, we have to look at that as opportunity. Opportunity. We can't see, and you're going to see in a second, we can't see what God sees. What to us looks like trash is opportunity for God. Mrs. White returned to the boat and said to Sutherland and McGann, quote, this looks like the place I have seen in vision. This is the place where God wants Sutherland and McGann to start their school. Upon inspecting the farm, the two men were dismayed. Hmm. For everything they saw was displeasing. Why aren't the lawns manicured? We can't think like that, can we? No, no. They didn't have the money to buy the huge farm. Can God afford that farm? They had had a small, attractive, fertile farm in mind. They wanted it to be what they call turnkey, ready to move right in, right? That's not God's plan. That doesn't build character. They had had a small, attractive, fertile, what's funny is the word fertile. They wanted it just ready to go, right? They sat down together on a rock and wept. Can you picture that? It's too much work but ultimately decided to surrender to their destiny and Mrs. White's advice. Two grown men crying over too much work to do. We need Jesus, don't we? We need Jesus. The farm known as the Nelson Place, and at that time owned by a Mr. Ferguson, was purchased for $12,723. Taking its founder's last cents, now they're broke. The school was founded in 1904, and the first term began with 11 students. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. Yet it grew. Isn't that how God works? Yeah. And under Ellen White's guidance, its educational philosophy was formed. She called Madison God's beautiful farm. Amen. And she had a special love for the work of its founders, Sutherland McGann, 1864-1947. He later became a renowned figure in medical education. Yes, he did. So she had a special, I'm, let me finish this. 
a special affinity or love for also M. Bessie DeGraw and Mrs. Nellie H. Drulard. Neither a college nor a school. Did you hear that? Do you, did you digest that? Madison in its early years was a special school as shown by its name, Nashville Agricultural Normal Institute, indicating training in what? Agriculture, which Mrs. White believes should be basic to all other studies and in normal courses or teaching. Unlike other schools, for example, Madison had no organized athletic program. Does God want sports or like sports? No. No. There was a, 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 something Sister White wrote. Something happened in Australia during those 10 years when she was in Australia. And she was at the school. I think it was Cornbong. And the kids were out there. The students were out there playing volleyball and, and tug of war. And the faculty were out there watching them do this and participate. So she went to bed that night, Sister White, and had a, the Lord sent her a vision. And he told her, if I had come this day and seen those t teachers t allowing the students to participate in this activity, they would have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Don't participate in sports. Don't watch sports. It's not God's plan. They would have been lost if he had come that day because they were allowing the students to play sports. It's serious, brothers and sisters. It's competition. Yeah. Competition is of the devil. Isaiah 14, Isaiah 28. I'm sorry, Ezekiel 28. You guys know the verses. There was no time for such things. Amen. And students got plenty of exercise through what? Farming. That's God's plan. And useful work. Sutherland had inaugurated this concept when, as president of Battle Creek College, he had plowed up the athletic field to make a vegetable garden. Can you say amen? <laughs> amen. Brother was fearless, huh? He was fearless. After it got underway, Madison lost no time putting into action his plan of sending teachers to set up Madison-type rural units or hill schools to help the impoverished people of the South Hill and Mountain Country who had no schools. Small institutions, small. That is God's plan, small. By 1914, some 40 such schools started from Madison, were in operation in the South with more than 1,000 students in attendance. So that divides up, do the math, that's roughly 25 students per, per school, per Hill School. That's God's plan. Small, manageable, manageable. So where did the idea for this type of school originate from? Remember yesterday, the system of education instituted at the beginning of the world was to be a model for man throughout what? All after time. That's where the idea came from. The Eden school, the original, the original. As my grandkids would say, the OG. So that was a model, model school, right? Model school. Robert Ripley, Ripley's Believe It or Not, anybody ever hear of him? Yeah. He wrote, only self-supporting school and college in America, talking about Madison, receives no, listen, get this lesson, no county, state, or federal aid, no money from anybody. Who, who, who was supporting it? God was. God was. Buildings, grounds, and equipment costing $520,000 represents profits of 27 campus, what, industries operated by who? The students. Everything was self-contained. I mentioned one of our ministries back home is we, we breed full-blood German Shepherd puppies. You can make a, a, general, a generally decent living doing these things, I'm telling you. My wife does all kinds of things with her hands. She soaps and lotions and she cans and juices, everything. And when we moved there, she didn't know how to do any of it. That's the amazing part. God trained her. He trained her. And I'm just giving you just off the top in my head. God has trained her, taken her to school. Eleanor Roosevelt, America's first lady. In 1938, Eleanor Roosevelt devoted one of her daily articles to the school. At the special request of U.S. Secretary of State Cordell Hull, she visited Madison and reported on an interview, in an interview with Floyd Braillard, Sutherland's brother-in-law. She says, no student receives a degree until he or she has acquired two, two skills in any line which seems to fit their capacity. 
he had made a survey of 1,000 of his graduates, and not one among them had been forced to accept help either from the government or private agencies during these difficult years. This is during the Depression. We all know about the United States Depression, right? Not one student. They worked with their hands, and they made a living with their hands. P.P. Claxton, U.S. Com now he's the commissioner of education back then. I have seen many schools of all days in many countries, but none more interesting than this, Madison. Nowhere else have I seen so much accomplished with what? So little money. Amen. Because God was with that institution. He was with it. God was with it. So 1912, turning point number one. The College of Medical Missionary or Medical Evangelists, a.k.a. Loma Linda University. They made a fatal mistake. They received accreditation, 1912. 1931, three SDA universities made a major bad decision. Emmanuel Missionary College, which is now, as we all know, uh, senior moment. Somebody help me out. Andrews. Andrews, thank you. Pacific Union, PUC in Angwin, and Walla Walla. They all accredited, all three of them. Remember, if somebody's giving them money, yeah. you, 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 can't, you can't tell me I can't serve, sell coffee in your cafeteria. What are you talking about? I can put beef jerky, anything I want to in there. I own you now. I'm giving you money. It's not your school anymore. That's the principle. The danger of accreditation. One, in 1911, Ellen G. White spoke out against accreditation. She said, better to close all our institutions than receive money from the world. Two, line of demarcation disappears. The SDA movement can no longer be considered peculiar. Three, the state now dictates what our schools teach, eat, drink, wear, and how and when to worship and how to worship, including what? The Sabbath. Four, by the 1940s, brothers and sisters, all of our colleges and universities were accredited. All of them. There's one right there in Tennessee. I won't name it. Right there in Tennessee. We know somebody who works there. The sister told us they serve alcohol now in the school store. You've all heard of it, but I'm not going to say it because we're being recorded. But they serve alcohol in the school store. They have, they have, they have. And this is not a, 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 a judgment on anybody. It's not a condemnation. But they have homos. They have LGBT instructors at the school. Excuse me, I'm sorry about that. This is reality, brothers and sisters, in 2024. This is reality. We have gone the ways of the world, 100%. So SAU, Walla Walla, Andrews, they're no different than UCLA and Princeton. They're all the same. They're all the same. And the devil would have it thus. So Battle Creek, open 1866, closed 1942. Madison, open 1904, closed 1964. College of Medical, you know, Loma Linda, Open 1906, it currently operates as a world-renowned, cutting-edge, conventional medical hospital, best known for utilizing modern drugs for cancer treatment. They have commercials on the radio in Southern California. I've heard them personally, personally. They're advertising what they do. They're no different than UCLA Medical Center. My youngest son was born at UCLA Medical Center. It's no different now than uh, Loma Leonard. They're the same. The same motivation, same motive. Oh, Ellen G. White Memorial Hospital opened 1913 again, just like the world. No different. And I showed you yesterday, you saw where it's located right there in the heart of L.A. So that's our place again. In our sanitariums, the sick are to be healed and they are to receive a knowledge of right methods of living. You are making a right move in establishing a sanitarium on a large tract of land you purchased for the Madison School. The building may be simple, yet perfect in all its arrangements. Let it be a what? A model that others may copy. A model. That's our template. The Madison School. From where? The original? Eden. The Eden School. So your home institution... Needs to be a mini Madison, a mini Madison, right? It's not just your house. It doesn't even belong to you. It's for others in need, right? That's how you have to look at it. But a lot of people get to the country 
and they want to build up and live just like they were. I mentioned yesterday, like they were when they left Cincinnati or Miami or wherever they were, Toronto, wherever. It's not God's plan. God's plan is this is your property on loan from me. Utilize it the way I need you to utilize it. So win souls, bring in souls to the kingdom. And he has a perfect plan set up. Remember one manuscript release, 228 paragraph two. God's purpose for giving a third angel's message to the world is to prepare people to, to stand true to him when? During the investigative judgment. This is the purpose for which we establish and maintain our publishing houses, our schools, our sanitariums, hygienic restaurants, treatment rooms, and food factories. This is our purpose in carrying forward every line of work in the cause. That's God's plan for the country. That's his plan. So the Country Outpost Center, it should be, it should be like a revolving door. Let's dig into it. So workers should be going out, and your worker, the workers, when you first get there, it's just you and your husband or husband and wife, or if you're alone, it's just you. You may be bringing people by God's grace later, as time goes. But you should be leaving that place to go where to work, the city. Work the city. Work the city. Consecrated, self-sacrificing workers. A lot of young people we talk to want to get into the work. They're excited about the work, but the motive is wrong. They see all the, you know, Facebook and YouTube and all the traveling and all that. They, they're, they're attracted to that. But we tell them, no, well, you know that cleaning toilets, and that's, that's part of missionary work too. Yeah. You know, changing diapers and all people, adult diapers. and yeah. They don't like to hear that. You got to go out and work, you know, in the rain sometimes to plant stuff or dig stuff up in the pouring rain, lightning, you know, I've, I've done all that. Headlights on at night, get the cars and turn the headlights on, we're planting at midnight. That's what you have, you have to do what you have to do. Yeah. They don't like that. They, they disappear when you start giving them the real nuts and bolts of a country living, right? But these are things that you have to do. It's, sacri it's a sacrificial work. Do I like being out at midnight? With my headlights lit in the garden out there working, I don't like doing that. But I have to, I have to be sacrificial. I have to sacrifice sometimes. Health guests are doing what? Coming in. Coming in. So your property is a country training base, and it's also a city mission training base. It's both. But it has to have this. Remember, it can't be too big and too institutionalized. It still has to have a family environment, a family feel. You have worship every morning and evening. It's all together. You eat together. You do all these things together. That's God's plan. Yes. So this is kind of involved, but basically this is the outpost center as far as your property being a country training base, and this is it being a city mission, talking about the city mission. So just kind of glance over these workers' homes, which is your house in the beginning. We plan, by God's grace, to have property set up on our property, a little home for people to come and live in, that we can all work together, right, yeah. in ministry. Mm -hmm. Home sanitarium, training institute, home gardens, food products from the garden, medical evangelistic training. And you don't have to have a 500-seat you know, auditorium to train people. Your living room is a classroom. Yeah. Got a couch and a couple of chairs, just... Stand there and teach. Sit there and teach. Amen? Amen. And most of our teaching, I, I, all I've been doing since I've been here Friday, since Friday, is basically repeating the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm doing. And I throw in a sprinkle of a little object lesson here or something that relates to what I'm talking about. I'm not going to change this or improve, improve on the spirit of prophecy. I can't do that. Mm -hmm. Just give, just, I, an old minister told me years ago, years ago, we were renewing this message, and he saw that we haven't had an aptitude and a desire to do more and do more. He said, always remember this. Never try to teach what you don't know. Only teach what you know. Because yeah. you'll get up there in front of people and start stuttering. Mm -hmm. Only teach what you know. And that was wise counsel. Mm -hmm. Very wise counsel. So home sanitariums involve health education, medical evangelistic training, of course, health guests, health food stores. We know a lot of ministries that have stores now. Yeah. I've mentioned the Davises uh, yesterday. They just opened up a new store down in Virginia, a health food store. Clinics, treatment rooms, cooking schools. You see everything kind of branches out and weaves together. Health evaluations, right, or consultations, simple treatments, cooking and health instruction, 
home nursing treatments, health lectures, house-to-house -house work, literature evangelism, Bible work. Now, how about the home garden? It stretches out, too. Tentacles everywhere. Food products, obviously, right? Home sanitariums. Industrial training. Health education. Is a garden a part of the health message? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Health food stores. Hygienic restaurants. Clinics. We're going to feed people the right way, right, for them to get well. Treatment rooms. Cooking schools. Simple treatments. Cooking and health instruction. Home nursing treatments. Christian help work. Health lectures. Industrial training. And, of course, health guests. And every plant of the field, Genesis 2.5. Before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. This is important. Not a man to do what? Till the ground. Did God create the ground before he created man in Genesis 1? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Remember that? You remember that, young person. Praise the Lord. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostril the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So man is not a soul, right? I mean, I'm sorry, man does not have a soul, which most people in the world say. We are souls based on two components, right? Breath and earth. Breath and earth. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. I love this verse. Is that an example for us? God planted a, a garden. He planted a garden. And then we're talking about here, brothers and sisters, relationship. He didn't tell Adam, get in the garden and get to work. I believe there was some touching involved. He put him there. He didn't tell him to go there. He put him there. Is there something wrong or, or, or weird about me touching my brother here? No. He's my brother. That's how God felt about Adam. So he put him, took him by the hand, however he did it, and he put him in the garden. Right? Relationship. Relationship. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. Mm. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden to what? To, of Eden to what? To till the ground from whence he was taken. Now this, this, we're talking about two things here now. In Genesis 2, 15, this was his job. I'm going to talk, break this down in a second. Now this is after they were evicted from the Garden. Who, somebody said something. What was that word? Sin. Sin. But watch this. Most people don't catch this. Read this carefully. The employment God gave to Adam before sin, my sister, was to till the ground. You got that, right? The employment God gave Adam after sin was to till the ground. Did you get that? The Bible says God doesn't change. Therefore, God's original plan for man hasn't changed. So he created Adam and gave him a job, garden. After they sinned, he put him out, evicted him from the garden and said, your job is still to garden. Did you get that? Yeah. For I am the Lord, I changed not. I quoted this yesterday and Friday. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Hebrews 13, 8. As a relaxation from study, education page 219. We're doing very good on time. Mm -hmm. Occupations pursued in the open air and affording exercise for the whole body are the most beneficial. No line, how many lines, church? No line of manual training is of more value than what? Agriculture. Agriculture. A greater effort should be made to create and to encourage an interest in agricultural pursuits. Let the teacher call attention to what the Bible says about agriculture. That it was God's plan for man to till the earth. That the first man, the ruler of the whole world, was given a garden to cultivate. And that many of the world's greatest men, its real nobility, have been tillers of the soil. Does God know what he's doing? Can we ever question him? No. The school at Madison not only educates in a knowledge of the scriptures... But it gives a practical training that fits the student to go forth as a self-supporting missionary to the field to which he is called. In his student days, he is taught how to build, 
simply and substantially how to cultivate the land and care for the injured. A full education, full rounded, right? This training for medical missionary work is one of the grandest objects for which any school can be established. The grandest, the greatest, the best. The time is soon coming when God's people, because of what's that word right there? Persecution will be scattered in many countries. You may not be in Canada in five years from now. It's very conceivable. Didn't we just read that? I told a class I was teaching a few months ago in Alabama, don't be so married to the nation you live in. You have to start to kind of mentally disconnect a little bit, especially in the United States. You don't know what God's going to do or allow it to happen for your best and my best interest. Those who have received an all-around education will have the advantage where they are. No matter where, where you are, just like the Madison students, you can help people on different levels, several levels. In our sanitariums, the sick are to be healed, and they are to receive a knowledge of right methods of living. I just read that one ago. So we're talking about, we're highlighting the word model. The building may be simple, yet perfect in all its arrangements. Let it be a what? Model that others may copy. A model. Had all our schools encouraged work in agricultural lines, they would now have an altogether different showing. But the instruction which the Lord had been pleased to give has been taken hold of so feebly that obstacles have not been overcome. Look at nature. There is room within her vast boundaries for schools to be established where grounds can be cleared and land cultivated for new schools. This work is essential to the education most favorable to spiritual advancement. For nature's voice, read this with me, is the voice of Christ. Yes. Teaching us innumerable lessons of love and power and submission and perseverance. Mm, power. That's what I learned when I saw that tree root, that big root come out of the ground that day. Power. I just saw, all I saw was power coming out of the earth. Power. Some do not appreciate the value of agricultural work. Mm. He who earns his livelihood by agriculture escapes many temptations and enjoys unnumbered privileges and blessings denied to those whose work lies in the great cities. And in these days of mammoth trusts and business competition, Wall Street, there are few who enjoy so real an independence and so great certainty of fair return for their labor, as does the tiller of the soil, Adam, brother Adam. So model one, the system of education instituted where? In Eden, the Eden School, true education, the science of true education, the true science of education. Two, the Madison School in Tennessee. Three, the eternal school, Eden restored in heaven. Can you say amen, church? Eternity will provide endless opportunity for learning and growth. Heaven is a what? School. A school. Its field of study, the universe. Its teacher, the infinite one. Brothers and sisters, we, we have to get there. There could be nothing on this earth, no matter how tragic it may seem, in, in our finite bodies, that's more important than that. Nothing. We've got to cling as tight as we can to Jesus and not let go. Not let go. A branch of this school was established in Eden, and the plan of redemption accomplished. Education will again be taken up where? In the Eden school. But where? In heaven. In heaven. Isaiah 65, 21. And they shall, I'm going to make this personal. And we shall build houses. Amen? Amen? And we shall build houses and inhabit them. And they, meaning us, shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. Don't you want to eat a heavenly pomegranate? I love pomegranate. Do you want to taste a heavenly mango? We got to get there, saints. We have to get there. 22. They shall not build and another inhabit. No squatters. Amen. No squatters in heaven. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. Mm. Do you want to be in that group? What color are they wearing? 
Isaiah 61.10 talks about the righteous robe, the Christ's righteous robe. The righteous robe of Christ. I want to wear that robe. Amen. They're wearing this robe. We have to be in that number. We have to be in that number. Amen. You get down, get on your knees. You get discouraged, get on your knees. You get depressed, get on your knees. This is our future, God willing. Amen. Then we began to look at the glorious things outside of the city, the holy city, the new Jerusalem. It, it, it's almost as if God is telling the devil, no, you, you want to mock me and make, create something that I didn't want my people to live in? I'm going to show you a real city, a heavenly city. Amen. Amen. Whose builder and founder is God. Amen. There I saw most glorious houses that had the appearance of what? Silver. Supported by four pillars set with pearls most glorious to behold. These were to be inhabited by us. And each was a golden shelf. I saw many of the saints go into the houses, take off their glittering crowns. Remember, every crown will have at least, at least one star. At least one star. Their glittering crowns and lay them on the shelf. Then go out into the field by the houses, your home garden. To do something with the earth. What do you call that? Gardening. Not as we have to do with the earth here. No, no. No aches and pains. No stooping, right? No herniated discs. Amen. Amen. A glorious light shone about all their heads. And they were continually shouting and offering praises to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Is that a family? I created this little saying a few years ago. Start today. Those of you who are trying to get to the country, start today. Don't delay. Pack and what? Pack and pray. Start today. Do not delay. Can we pray? All right. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful again for your mercy, love, and truth. Help us to understand, Lord, with our finite, feeble brains, our peanut brains, to have a more clearer conception of how much you love us. We can never understand how large you are, how awesome you are, how you're limitless, your unlimited power, but also your unlimited love for your children. Help us to never forget, Lord, you are a power source that we can tap into 24-7, 365, anytime we need you. Help us, Lord, to, to get out of the mindset of being an inst expecting an instant answer to, your, to our prayers. That discourages so many of us. You don't, we know from the Bible, you don't always operate like that. In more cases than not, that's not how you work. You need to develop faith in us. So many times you delay, you delay, and it's for our own good. It builds faith. Mm -hmm. Help us to recognize that, Lord, please. I want to pray for those who have children who are out of the ark of safety, that you would please save them. Mm -hmm. We claim, Isaiah 49, 25, that you will save our children. Yeah. We are so blessed, Lord, as a family. Our youngest son baptized three weeks ago after 10 years of constant prayer constant prayer he declared to me on his 18th birthday that he was going back into the world and didn't like being raised at venice he told me that lord you saw all this 10 years ago lord right there on that street in la that night and we wrestled for 10 years so that is something we want to share with every parent do not stop praying do not stop praying you will answer in your own way and in your good time to glorify your holy name not us Help us to trust more and believe. We thank you, Lord, so much for hearing and answering this prayer. Bless this church. Bless everything they're attempting to do here. I see a great potential here, great work being done here, Lord. I see a presence, truth, thread going through th throughout this whole entire church and what they're trying to do in this community. Please be with them, Lord. Have angels with the leadership and can keep them, Lord, on a narrow way that leads to eternal life. Please, to not be distracted to the right or to the left. Thank you, Lord, in advance for answering. Again, we love and thank you. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Amen. amen.